Yeah, let's actually start off exactly where we initially began before we started recording, because I feel like that's such a perfect entry point, which is that you called it a paradigmless natural state that most recently you felt. And will you elaborate on that for us? Yeah, um, up until August of 2021, I had some sort of like, okay, I was enlightened, right? I considered myself enlightened and I knew that the self that I considered enlightened was not real, you know, that it's just a thing you say. You're describing this experience by saying, you know, I am enlightened. This experience is an enlightened experience. It's expansive. It's uh, perceived as all one, you know, pure oneness, emptiness, you know, nothingness, awareness. So I followed the awareness route to that realization, to enlightenment, basically, what I considered enlightenment at the time, which is what gave me this expansive view and the view of oneness, uh, because everything was made of awareness very clearly. Um, all people, all things, and I was one and the same as this awareness. I was both the thing awareing and the objects of that awareness itself. So I considered, okay, that's done. To me, this is non-duality, you know, awareness, aware of awareness. So that's where I was. And no self in the sense of no Colette character. The Colette character had been completely seen through. All of its thoughts, its memories, everything was like, oh, that's just a story. It was never real. But I started to watch Frank Yang's YouTube videos and I was like, there's a difference between his experience and mine. Mine isn't trippy. It's not, I mean, yes, I have blissful states, right? I have blissful kind of psychedelic states, but it's not anything to write home about. Of course, this is spectacular, uh, perceiving no separation, beautiful, but there's this thing that my experience doesn't match everything that he says. And that was the first time I'd encountered someone's teachings that I couldn't relate to. So then I started thinking about what if what I'm in is a construct? Nice. And I, I used different things. I started to think about deep sleep. You know, whatever deep sleep is doesn't matter. But it was like my gateway into thinking, what is this awareness that I think is my continual baseline state? Am I truly always aware? What is my experience of deep sleep? Then I started to think about flow. You know, when you're in an activity and you just lose yourself in that activity. After that activity, I'm like, yeah, I was aware because I can remember. So I'm, I was aware. There wasn't an absence of awareness. Then I realized that's an afterthought. In the moment when I was in flow, I was not aware in the literal sense. And so that started to crack this awareness paradigm. And whether or not, you know, you're aware or not, doesn't even matter. You know, whether you're aware in deep sleep, aware in flow state, doesn't matter. That's just the train that I took to get to, you know, this place of, oh my goodness, what? Mm -hmm. So after that, taking into account the fact that I didn't match Frank's experience, I started to think about the nature of awareness. And I thought, what is awareness without something to be aware of? Mm -hmm. And that was my main final sort of inquiry. And I know that theoretically true non-duality is awareness, aware of awareness, which is technically one thing, right? But then I started thinking, that's like saying, I'm eating, but there's no food, right? I'm eating and eating. It doesn't quite make sense. There are two things here. Awareness implies something to be aware of, whether it's awareness aware of itself or awareness aware of multiplicity, that's still the subtlest of dualities. And so last year I sat down and I found myself meditating and I was doing what Frank spoke about in his videos, which is Vipassana. And I was looking for the source of this awareness because for something to be in the subtle duality, there has to be a subject and an object. 
a subject must be present perceiving something. So I realized, hey, there's this pull in my head. There's a sensation in my head that believes it is aware. Bear in mind, I had popped the locality bubble in a way as well. I no longer felt I was in my head. So it was a perfect paradigm, ideal enlightenment. But this thing was taking credit for awareness somehow, subtly. And in a moment that I objectified that thing, it was like a desolate wasteland immediately. It was like um, gravity was acting on the body for the first time. I remember sinking back into the couch that I was sitting on with this crazy inertia. And this before, you know, you've got the center in the body and you feel like you are sort of holding it together. And then as soon as the center falls out, it's like, oh my goodness, the, the body is being acted on by gravity in the same way as like this pen or whatever. So the center fell away completely. And I realized that awareness and any other paradigm, God, uh, non-duality, spirituality, anything, all of that fell away, all of it. And that's why I haven't said anything on social media for six months. This is the first time I say anything publicly because it took me this long to be able to understand what had happened because I can no longer use any concepts or any words before I could say, oh, I've now recognized awareness of awareness. I have now recognized myself as God consciousness, the pure I. But in that moment, all of that fell away, every single thing. And so I simply do not know anymore. <laughs> you know, I do not know. Now I don't know. I knew, I knew, you know, you say you don't know, but in a way you, you've got the safety of knowing, like mm -hmm. I'm awareness. I'm all powerful, infinite awareness. But you're something so much bigger, actually. You're, you are beyond even the, the highest of non-dual paradigms. So that's what happened. And for the last six months, there's sensations in the body and like wind and sounds are all like doing this. They're overlapping. And the body has no place in the center. So the body feels like it's been as if it were like a puppet. And then the, the strings were cut on the puppet. Or like I told Frank, where the body was normally like the center, now the universe feels like a hand and the body's like one of the fingers. Mm -hmm. Or the body is like one of the things floating around in a snow globe. It has no anchor anymore. Mm -hmm. And since then, true no suffering, true no self and true no suffering. No self in God, no self in awareness. No self in any paradigm whatsoever, completely groundless. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it feels like an honor um, to be um, a, uh, a, that you felt an energetic draw to be able to share here with me on uh, this channel for the first time. And, in six months. And it also um, feels really divine with the way that um, where we're both at, because um, I feel very similarly to um, what you describe, which is the inability to really speak um, about it the last uh, half a year also. And although um, there have been <clears throat> although there have been shifts happening um where you what you just described and how i feel um it it um it's really like destructive of any paradigms and ideas and concepts um and I like how you called it the train of awareness, because that is kind of like what it is, is um, it's like a train that we take um, back inwards um, to source, if you will, or to um, knowing what we truly are. Um, and even that um, exploding into the mystery, infinite mystery. Um, and, and then, yeah, it becomes, yeah, very groundless. Um, and also, um, the like I, I like how also 
um, shunyata, emptiness, can be also translated to uh, hollowness. That's another great, um, yeah, like recent um, feeling. Because and then like the hollowness can sort of like the intelligent um, energy or infinity, if you will, can um, sort of um, just most effortlessly just flow the body mind to where it needs to be. Um, and mm -hmm. even to serve the rest of, um, creation, like waking up, um, yes. and without a sense of self that is constantly, um, needing to tie everything to its mm. sense of worth or, um, image, um, and things like that. Yeah, you're completely free floating, you know, by the will of whatever you want to call it. You are no longer resisting anything. And so you're following your literal divine path. You know, if you if we were to call it anything, the true freedom of no longer resisting some sort of, you know, given way for the character. And um, yeah, just not not being locked into anything. The The free flow of not being locked in is insane you know as long as you're locked into something whether you know a hobby a, a job a non-dual paradigm enlightenment you are limiting yourself you are setting up boundaries in which the character can only move like you know this within this paradigm and as soon as you shed the paradigm and you you're a free agent you'd be surprised you know you just get done whatever to and with you're just a puppet for whatever this is. I love how you also described it like a being the hand and then of the universe and then the body being a finger. Um, that's a great one. I've also used the, uh, the towel as an analogy because you know the towel has all of the little, little uh, <laughs> yeah. pokey yeah, bits for that are strings that then are what like absorbs the water from our body when we rub it. Yeah. And so then we're, that's the towel ness, if you will, is like the universal ness. And then all of those little body minds are the little strings. Um, mm. And I, and, it, and it's just how the mystery expresses itself in this dimension, we could say. Yeah yeah and yeah it's a seeming multiplicity but not really you know and it, it's not even wholeness it is not even oneness you know so if you're stuck in oneness yeah just drop it and see what happens it is something far beyond that total mystery the first time you can say nothing about something yeah. that's that's such a big deal because we always have something to say <laughs> you know we always we can always talk about stuff and even this we're talking about but we you know we can't really but what a feat to actually be experiencing something for once that i cannot describe yeah and you know the it, it's interesting what you said about the like mission awakening mission before i was thinking you know people are sort of caught up in different you know things some people are like spiritual some people believe in like spreading the message of awakening and i was like unknowingly negating those roles i was thinking you know that's not the point the point is to you know, the point is to just get yourself enlightened and then whatever happens happens you know so there was like this kind of bias to like uh you could say spirituality and like spreading of the message because what does it matter because source doesn't care if anyone wakes up to it and yada 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 and then when the center fell away, I found myself immensely involved in spirituality for the first time, started reading the law of one, um, got into the raw channeling, all of the stuff that I'd previously thought is ridiculous, you know, mass awakening, um, you know, these goals that I thought were futile or egoic have now just started flourishing without a center. So there's now this like mission mission to help people see what's seen here but with no internal egoic need to do so Perfect. and it seems to truly just be the way that things are you know it's not because someone needs to feel fulfilled by teaching and making someone else enlightened it's not that it's even when the center falls away you're still you still find yourself helping others whether you like it or not because that's just the way things go it's like this thing wants to spread itself 
yeah if if you're not spreading it you're in a way caught in a bit of a paradigm i have read um what's it perfect brilliant stillness by david cars and he said he's just you know he woke up and no matter how many people uh, begged him to teach this thing he just refused because he doesn't want to lose it he doesn't want to make it into a concept you know that's kind of like fear-based Mm-hmm. If you let yourself loose completely, you'll find yourself naturally um, spreading this thing. So whether whether it's via spirituality, law of one, um, Dharma missions, you know, it's great. It's great. And it's the way this thing moves. This yeah. thing moves by spreading itself. It's, it's definitely, I mean, it's not entirely true, but it's pretty true to say that it's the way things should go. It is the evolution of humankind yeah. toward, you know, the foreseeable future. Yeah. So it's great, you know, what you're doing with the team and um, just getting out there and having fun while doing it. It's fantastic. And before I would have negated that, you know, I would have thought it doesn't matter. I don't know why they care. You know, why do they care? And here I am caring so much, like these people need to wake up. <laughs> So yeah, you just get you get totally destroyed. Everything, all your all the stuff you thought, you know. I was like, crystals don't work. No, apparently, you know, everything else relative truth. Um, I thought the law of one was just relative, but that's the thing. The relative is the absolute. Yeah. There is no absolute truth. The absolute is the relative. They are intertwined and one and the same. And yeah. enlightenment is not a goal. It's a it's the journey. It's this entire thing happening. Mm-hmm. Whether spiritual, not spiritual, you want to renounce all your stuff, you want to go live in an ashram, you want to, I don't know, party it up in the Bahamas, who cares? Who cares? It's the way this thing moves. Yeah. We could even say that there's a, there are a couple different um, thresholds and at, um, like these different thresholds of deconstruction, we could say, um, of the sense of, let's say four things primarily that I've noticed it's self, others, world, and stories, those four things. And the deconstruction of those through inquiry, Vipassana, concentration, meditation, realization, integration, that that typically takes us to thresholds. And we could say that if we get locked into one of those paradigms or thresholds, that there's typically still a a non-deconstructed remnant left because we're still locked into a conceptual paradigm. And then as we sort of blow through those, because there's still something that feels unwhole or it still feels um, like the seeking impulse is still there. We we recognize that it becomes more and more non-conceptual, um, paradigmless, and when that fully hollows out, then it's an organic feeling without a sense of self that the only thing that's left is for this body mind to be a vessel or a channel for the universe knowing itself and waking up to itself and there's nothing else for it to do for it to be for it to express and it's that's that's also liberation um like you said earlier there's you're following the divine blueprint um and there's just such a like there's a warmth it's like a it becomes like a musical instrument that's just yeah being played in the symphony um yeah yeah exactly. yeah you know like you said if you're locked into something no matter how in life you do experiences there's an anchor somewhere that's keeping you locked in whether that's a story or a sensation um, or a self, you know, as long as you have a self in something, 
you will be locked into something. And that's just that. And it can be as simple as like three questions. One, are you suffering? Yes or no? Two, is there a self? Is there any self? Do you identify as anything? And then the third one, is there a subject to your experience? If something is happening to something else, there is an anchor, there is a subtle self, there is a paradigm, because this is subjectless. There is no subject here whatsoever. There's literally no one, no one experiencing. There's no thing experiencing, not even awareness is experiencing because that makes awareness a subject. Not even God is experiencing itself because then God is a subject. This is completely subjectless. You can say it's pure object, but even object has to exist with reference to a subject. So, you know, when people come to me, it's like, hey, are you suffering? Because they think they're done. Are you suffering? Uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, sometimes there are kind of uncomfortable moments, and uh, but the but the awareness is there, and I'm aware of it, and I'm like, okay, you know, that's that. You're you're just you're stuck. You're stuck. Because you're still suffering. You're just rationalizing. You're saying, oh, I'm aware of it. You know, good. Or whatever. Or, or you're combating your suffering with like a God consciousness mentality, which is like, I don't need to suffer. I am super strong. I'm infinite uh, God, infinite awareness. Still not. Still not. And there's a subject there. There's something taking agency. What's doing that? What's doing that? What's deciding like, oh, I'm taking witness position. Oh, I am awareness. Because when this whole thing is flattened out and you see that there's zero subject, the, the so-called subject from before is like happening, but it's happening as like simultaneous, um, like firework events. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. when I decide like I want to watch Netflix or something, I can feel the sensation of wanting to watch Netflix, a pull across my chest, which before was like, oh, I, I, the subject, want to go watch Netflix. Now I feel the sensation arise, the thought of Netflix simultaneously, but there's no one underneath that. And there's, there's no, there's literally no agency, no subject, total emptiness. It's desolate, desolate, desolate. And another thing that I realized with the, that recent shift was that this entire thing perceivably now takes up no space, no space. And it, that was one of the most frightening aspects of this realization because I knew theoretically okay we're a dream in God's mind you know we're a thought we're the original thought but practically in my experience things kind of had shape I could see the ephemeral I could see the transparency of the awareness that things were made up of but it didn't do this you know it didn't nothing collapsed on itself and now when I look around even though there's apparent space in the room I'm in I can see that this is not even an atom's size of space. Mm. We, we barely exist. We barely exist. And um, you can say we don't. We don't exist in the literal sense. None of this is real in the sense you know, of taking up space and happening in time. Mm -hmm. It's all just you know, in, in the exact same way as the dream you have at night. Very common analogy that non-dual teachers use. You know, in what space did that room that you dreamt of take place? Mm -hmm. And I knew that theoretically, and because I'd heard it, but I never saw it. So in that moment, when that dropped away, I was like, because <gasps> the walls just closed in, the body just disappeared. And now, no matter how far I look, it's like smooshed. Yeah. Like, it just takes up no volume, which is insane. And if that's not your experience, like carry on. You know, don't, don't, people mustn't be discouraged um, because I see so many people making like rationalizations. Like I said, I'm, I'm aware of it. Um, I know I'm awareness, so it's fine. It's hurting the character, but it's not hurting me. All of those are justifications. They're all paradigms. They're all your mind trying to keep you in this box that you don't see the reality that we're talking about. You know, very, very clever, very smart mind. Let's use the most subtle non-dual trap the last one let's hope they stay here and if they see through it damn it but so many don't even teachers there's so many teachers that 
at least perceivably from their teachings are teaching from a paradigm, which I understand in one way, because if we didn't, we'd have nothing to talk about and we just sit there like this. But it's a hint to really investigate your experience and be honest. What am I sticking to? What do I believe myself to be? Do I believe myself to be God? Is that my experience? Is life happening to me, no matter who that me is? Life happening to awareness? Life happening to God? If that's the case, it should be investigated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love the three that you brought up. It's a really great way to have an access point or an entry point. Um, so, of course, suffering is, and just being honest with these two, suffering um, if there is still suffering, if there is still a sense of self, and then how do you differentiate the second and the third, the sense of self and the subject? I would say that the subject is like a perceivable thing. And the sense of self is an identification, a mental identification. So the sense of self is like, I rest my sense of self in awareness. I know intellectually, and it's my experience that I am God, I am awareness. And then the third one would be, is experience happening to something? Because you see, some people stop on the second and they say, no, I'm none of these things. I don't have any identifications because their mind is smart enough to say, no, I don't identify as anything. I identify as what is, whatever. I don't have any identifications, but then there's still a sense of separation in the third step. Is this thing that you're not identifying with happening to someone? Yeah. And I mean, we could add a fourth one, actually. Are mm. you seeking? Mm. Are you seeking? Mm. Nice. Yeah. Cool. I like that. Mm -hmm. Because if, uh, if there's no suffering, there's no seeking, no self and no subject or no duality, then the natural state seems to be operating the show. Um, and if any of those things are uh, in place, then there's further, let's say, investigation. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Further freedom yeah. to feel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not like work, you know, as long as you're looking at it like, oh, there's more seeking to do. I've got more. I need to do more inquiry. Damn it. You might as well just, just stop right there and go do something else and come back when you actually feel like yeah. finding out what you are, you know, sincerely, because you're already right off on the wrong foot. If you're thinking of it as like a job or like, oh, it's so much effort to like loosen the center. I really need to sit here for pause there for eight hours. Just stop. You know, that in itself is a paradigm. Just release that. And then you're already more free than you would have been eight hours into Vipassana. Yeah. Or is a bumblebee in my room? <laughs> yeah. So it really takes honesty. It takes... I've heard idea referred to honesty as something really important. And before this, I was like, oh yeah, he's just being idea. You know, idea is very, um, what's it, like subjective level. He's very homey, very sweet with people's problems. And I thought that honesty was one of those things. You know, yeah, I'll be honest, obviously be a good person or whatever. But no, it's pointing to a radical honesty within yourself about where you are. Exactly, yeah. Yep. And you can't, you can't deny your experience. You know, it takes honesty to look at your experience and say, I am still seeking or I am still suffering. Yeah. I've just been putting a mental overlay on my suffering, but I am still suffering. That is really strong to be able to do that, to be able to open yourself to the idea that you have inquiry to do or that you have further exploring, yeah. you know, like you said, further freedom. Mm -hmm. That is incredible. And that's why it's so rare because it's comfortable, you know, is awakening comfortable for you? If it's, if it's comfortable, it's not it, man. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're comfortable in your paradigm, if you're comfortable, oh yes, I'm done. This is a, uh, yeah, this I'm done. I'm happy as awareness. That comfort is illusory. That's the comfort of the mind. I don't think I'm ever comfortable anymore. You know, in terms of concepts, I have no idea what to do or say. And that's the beauty of it. It's like you, the next moment, you have no idea. Yeah, it's so fresh. And you, you don't know what you are. Yeah, it's so fresh. Mm -hmm. it's, it's stale to think you're something. 
it it gets old. Yeah. Stop thinking yourself. You are your true nature is the absence of being a thing. That's what you are. The absence of being something. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And you can feel the freedom and tune into that. You feel the liberation. Yeah. yeah, it's just the absence, the absence of something, the absence of resistance, the absence of a plan. It's just creating itself on the spot, moment to moment. And that's also, you know, why we can be so casual about this. You know, we, we know we're not trying to be anything anymore. God, imagine you're trying to be something. Imagine that. Imagine caring. Imagine. And this is just so freeing. You know, for the first time, you don't need to be anything because you are already it. So just suspend all of that. You're done. You're done. Mm hmm Mm, yeah, the freedom of not being a thing. Yeah, that, that came to me and I thought, yeah, it is that. Because it, it took six months you know, for, for that to, to come. Because for, for six months, I had no clue. And then I was like, oh, you are not no thing. You are not emptiness. You are not awareness. All of these things, I'm like, it's not it. It's not it. Oh. You're the absence of being something. That's what you are. That's why we can't catch it. That's why none of the labels fit. That's, that's why if you're caught in a label, it's a paradigm and you can move out of it because you're not a thing. And we've heard that, but we still somehow make that into a thing. We're like, oh, I'm not a thing. That's the thing I am. I'm nothing. I'm no thing. But no, you're the absence of being a thing. Anything. That's going to be the, the thumbnail with your mm. picture. The absence of being a thing. Colette Davy. I agree. I really like it. I yeah. really like it. It's it's my only true wisdom from this <laughs> this whole thing. It's like the one thing that I'm like, okay, cool, we'll go with that. <laughs> Everything else just gets discarded. It's like, no, you are lying. You are lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love how clearly that just resonates with the word freedom, the absence of being a thing, freedom. Um, and I love how you brought up Adya and honesty. And before we started recording, when you, and when you shared about the, the paradigmlessness, and then immediately what came through, because there's no self image that wants to be seen a specific way. So then there's the ability for the intelligence to just channel through. And so the way that I responded, the way that it responded to itself was that there's simultaneously right now here the feeling of paradigmlessness and yet at the same time there's the the occasional um mental proliferation we could say um in the pali um buddhism it's called papanka um it's like mental conceptualization and mental proliferation around a sense of self self image the world others stories and so then there's a weaving, right? That's what the nibbana, nirvana, is the unweaving or the unfabricating. And so when you weave and when you fabricate and you can create a sense of contrast between those two and just relax more and more in the unweaved, in the unfabricated, um, in the empty, in the hollow. And then over time, the, the weaviness, the webbiness that 
that dependent arisingness of self others world stories relaxes more and more dissolves more and more and then so that's this honesty right that's just this honesty it isn't the the atlas character or finger of the universal hand doesn't need to appear any specific way to the other fingers to be valid right to be worthy and so exactly. that's freedom right that's freedom too yeah yeah trying to be anything other than what you are is resisting what is anything whether you're trying to i don't know you're trying to become something i mean go for it but you're resisting what you are let the becoming be what you are when you're becoming it don't think i need to be this way i need to be seen in i don't know like i need to be seen as a teacher or whatever oh my goodness yeah. imagine i i would have thought like i can't open for the the wasp that was there because i need to see more like spiritual i need to sit still but there's a wasp going zzz, so i was like hey i don't need to pretend anymore I just go open for the thing they set it free whatever they were both free you know yeah don't resist don't resist what you are we we just have these problems whether they're like superficial on like the level of the person i need to look different i need to um, be more intelligent i need to have better abilities at hobbies all the way to you know i need to become even more solidified in my awareness identity i need to become even more integrated and enlightened <laughs> <laughs> You know, bro, you are, you are it. You are the perfect manifestation of what is. And okay, within reason, because sometimes we need to believe that we need to improve to get to see this, right? We all, we all are seekers believing we need to really get somewhere. I really need to abide as awareness starting now. And I'm going to do it the whole day. We had to do that. We had to, for a certain amount of time, believe we need to be something else. We had to believe we need to become it. Until we saw, oh, oh, damn. No, I guess I've always been perfect. I guess I've always been loved. Damn, I've always been the mm -hmm. perfect program. There's never been a problem with me. Now, what now? Now I'm going to have so much free time. <laughs> I've always been perfect. There's never been a problem with me. And believing that was resisting the fact that I'm perfect, that everyone is perfect and unique. Believing that I had to change was just a mask over that so that I didn't see it. In the absence of the belief I need to be something different, what am I? I'm perfect. Because it's only the belief I need to be something else that creates that reality. It's, you know, your thoughts and your belief systems. So much of the manifest is created just from that. Mm -hmm. If you're believing something in a moment, that is your experience in that moment, guaranteed. If you believe I'm insecure, wow, you feel insecure. Wow, what a surprise. Throw away that thought, then what are you? Secure, safe, protected, loved, perfect, divine. And you are exactly where you're supposed to be. Because everyone thinks I need to be something better. I need to be somewhere else. I need to be doing better in my job, my relationship. Sure, holds relative truth in some cases, but normally, no, you don't. Just stop thinking that. Stop thinking that and see the perfection underneath your ridiculous belief. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like you, you now get to know your perfection for the first time. The person never existed, so the person never disappears. And so therefore this illusory person can finally know its perfection. It can finally stop trying to lose weight. It can finally stop trying to work harder than it wants to or can, pushing itself to the limit. Because even this illusory person now says, oh damn, I truly am a divine creation. And I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be at this point in time. And it could not be any other way. And that's the case for everyone. It's just that some people are not seeing it yet. And they need to believe they need to become for a bit until you see, oh wow. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Um, one of the things that uh, Bentinho Massaro and the No Limit Society uh, team, as well as community, are really um, focused on as a, 
as a paradigm for liberation, let's say, is the three or four body system. So we have the, the physical, the subtle, the causal, and then if you will, the great causal or the I am body, the awareness, love and light. And it's what you're describing right now is so beautiful because at the causal level is where all of the assumptions and the beliefs are seated. And they propagate into the subtle, into the mind and into the physical. So at that seed level, if you will use this beautiful visualization or this system that so perfectly, we could say mirrors the way that trees also blossom from seeds out into fruits. So very similarly. And so if the right nourishment isn't there at that seed level of that, you're, I'm already whole, I'm already free, um, I'm already one with it all. Um, I'm already empty and hollow of any need to try and get external validation and whatnot, then that will appear as the fruits in the physical will appear in, in the space of your awareness and consciousness. Um, but if there are these unwhole, unworthy, um, lacking, separate, local into the body thoughts um, that are at the seed level, constructs, if you will, then those will operate the show. And that's what we've been calling like the gremlin or the hitchhiker. And so you can really feel that uh, on your nervous system, like when not only for yourself, but for when you're around your other selves, you can really feel it when it's operating the show. And so the liberation is a process of inquiry into where did I pick up the belief or the assumption? And then that could also be called what real shadow work actually is. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. Again, you know, before all of this, I negated shadow work because I thought there's no person. The person doesn't exist. Why do I need to deal with a person's problems? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not going to. I'm just going to meditate and I'm going to negate this thing's existence. And then after the shift, I was like, oh, wow, what are these sensations? <laughs> what, what is this like that feels like trauma? It's weird because now it's just in the body. It's been cut loose of any suffering. So it's a very unusual case. Whereas normally people do shadow work as part of like spirituality before awakening, or they'll take the progressive path. Um, I kind of jumped into awakening. It was very fast. Um, and then like a year and a half later, this, the, the final shift happened. And so I didn't do any shadow work. I, I didn't, I left the character completely messed up traumatized and uh, all kinds of things feeling inadequate and after the shift I was like what is this like feeling of uh, not good enough what what is going on because it doesn't make any sense and so I've now realized that this 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 is an integral integral part of awakening I would have thought that it's separate you know my biased awareness mind would have thought no that's shadow work that's for the person what I'm doing is the real work I'm getting enlightened but no that's not how it works there are two sides of the same coin. So only now has this character started to investigate its thoughts and belief systems um, about regarding inadequacy and so on, because they don't, they don't click with the experience anymore. There's a very clear experience that everything is perfect, but then there's a sensation in the throat of fear um, and like a narrative passing through the head of like, I'm not good enough. And it's completely foreign. Mm -hmm. um, there's no longer this like thing that's believing it to be true. So it's not holding it together. But I was like, this is so weird. Is this what I was thinking about myself? That's insane. So now, you know, shadow work, great. And I'm starting to think like, these are the beliefs that were governing my outward behavior my whole life. And I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I only see it now. Nice. I only see it now. And, and you know, I should have before, but it is what it is, but it's, it's integral, integral, integral. It's, it's so important that the person gets aligned with its true nature, as well as like the, the perspective shift. Because you, you're just going to be like a mess of a person within the natural state. Don't even, don't do that. You want a holistic, full, aligned, cre like creatorship uh, experience. You don't want to feel inadequate within an enlightened framework. You don't want to. That's not pleasant. Don't ignore the person. 
it doesn't exist anyways. So exactly like what you said, these, these seeds that are planted, if you plant the inadequacy seed, what do you think is going to happen on the outside? Obviously, your, your entire circumstances are going to paint that picture for you because it's mirroring you. Mm -hmm. If I believe on the inside, I'm not good enough. Everything on the outside is going to tell me the same thing because reality yeah. is a mirror. Yes. If I am empty, reality is empty. Yeah. That's another thing I realized with the recent shift, that this is just like I've heard Bentino say, smoke and mirrors. Yes. It's, that's all it is. And so you can go right down to like your fundamental belief that's causing you some kind of friction or suffering or whatever, whether that's like, I lack something, I'm not good enough. I need to be something else. I need other people to validate me. I need attention. All of those can be traced back to an ev often an event, often years ago, you've been carrying this for 20, 30 years. And for some reason, as soon as you see that, like I was telling my boyfriend yesterday, as soon as you see this event cause this reaction, it's no longer the current thing that's causing it. You're like, oh, this started way before this person pissed me off. This feeling started 20 years ago. It's not because this person said something to me. It's got nothing to do with this. The circumstances are just painting the picture from 20 years ago and that belief got put in my head somehow. And so as soon as you see that, it already starts to unearth itself. It's like, oh, so this doesn't tie to this, which means I'm, I'm not inadequate in this situation. And it starts to unravel. Mm -hmm. And then you become empty first, and then you become full. You know, so it's first like, yes, you're, you're so caught up and you're so contracted and you feel like you're not good enough. And then you're like, okay, then there's emptiness. And there's just like this hollow, like, then what am I as a person? that's when like the fulfillment starts. Mm -hmm. What I am is perfect. What I am is good enough. Mm -hmm. And you, you unearth those like initial seeds or ideas or concepts, replace them with something way more aligned to what you actually are, way more aligned to your goal and um, just your mission here. And it just flourishes. It's like, thank goodness. Now you're giving, now, now it's true. It's, and because it's true, it, it just outpours, you know, these, these contracted energies seem to like stay stagnant. It's just constant experience, like victimizing you and you stay so small and you feel like you're not enough and I need to get people to like me. And as soon as you just let go of that, the truth of yourself that you are perfect just bursts open and it takes over your entire experience mm -hmm. because it's true. If anything is true, it'll resonate, it'll flourish, and it'll feel good. It'll feel good. If it feels bad, question it. It's, yeah. it's not aligned. You're believing something that's not true. Yeah. Yeah. And then using those feelings, those emotions as guidance. We've been talking about it like a guidance system, like the feelings and the emotions, the energetics are themselves a guidance system and so if there is a feeling of suffering or feeling bad that is typically a contraction in the sense of identity that there's an assumption of a sense of self of a sense of others world and getting lost in stories or at the seed level mm -hmm. that there's an assumption or a belief of unworthiness and then in the physical manifest level everything's like you said reflective and mirror like to that assumption or the belief and so the dissolving or the dislodging or the transmuting of those beliefs and assumptions is exactly what enables freedom from the contracted sense of identity and then by doing that we see in the physical in the manifest is reflected to us that beauty, the perfection, um, the non-locality also. And that's such a crucial piece uh, to this is that the it's a feeling that's sort of, it's so difficult to, to describe you. You mentioned how um, even space and time um, just seem to be very dreamlike. Um, just happening as a singularity of sorts and no 
time and no space. Um, and so there's this feeling of, in a sense, being the intelligence that is speaking and listening to itself at the same time right now. And this sort of uh, happening <laughs> as just manifestation um, and that already being free and that already being perfect. And, yeah. and then, yeah. And then there's a total like relaxation because of that. Hmm. Yeah. And it's really important to feel again, like the simultaneity of that everything already being perfect and free and yet also recognizing that yes there are we could say other selves that don't have their basic needs being met or that still live in very violent areas and that there is still a perfecting that this collective is undergoing in terms of meeting the basic needs of all mm. and um, having peace, true peace, um, with no violence and no, uh, the uh, total abandonment of weapons of mass destruction and um, things like that. Um, and so that the simultaneity is beautiful there because then you can still really radiate out the bodhisattva vibe, um, that it can radiate itself out into the collective, um, because it's that's exactly what it's seeking if you're tuned into the collective you can feel that what it's seeking is its own liberation is its own awakening um is the end of the assumptions and the beliefs that have been plaguing the collective for millennia of separation and lack etc yeah yeah um to to live on absolute level means to not negate any subjectivity. So if you are truly and wholly integrated in your clarity, you will not deny the suffering of others. You will not deny that people are not getting their needs met, that there are calls to service in the world. If you're denying any of that, you're not clear because you're denying something. This is a whole acceptance on all levels. Like, yes, I accept things as they are in that people are suffering. There are people that are not getting their needs met. However, acceptance does not imply indifference and it doesn't imply nonchalance and it does not imply that there's no call to service. So again, contradictory to my beliefs before, because I was thinking, hey, there's no, there's no one suffering. So it's fine. The kids in Africa, it's, it's fine because God allows it. You know, it's, it's, that's a denial. It's a denial of the humanity in you. If you see someone suffering, that whether you have a self or not, you're going to feel, oh my goodness, you're going to feel that heaviness here. And you can't deny that. So that's what drives this call to service. Yeah. Our humanity, our humanity acting simultaneously with our clarity and our awakening. And we just somehow intuitively know that we can't deny this, that we have to help. It just feels like, and there's no other way to explain it because it can be negated so fast by like non radical non dualists. Um, if I say anything, it can be negated. If I say, no, but I really feel like I need to help, they'll say it's just a story, but it's felt, it's felt as a deep sense of, I am almost obliged to help the end of suffering in any way that I can. And denying that is painful. It's, it's resisting and it's, it's contracted, it's contracted. So again, these stories that non-dual paradigm and the non-dual community tells itself, there's no self, so everyone can suffer. It doesn't matter. It's God's plan. You know, throw all of that away and you will go help that person on the street. Throw away your story. You know, you will, you will give $50 to the beggar. What, what are you doing? You're ignoring your humanity and your, man, your humanity itself is divine. There is no separation. There's no separation between your humanity and your empathy and call to service and the absolute. 
they are one and the same, just like through and through, you know, on almost like on levels. If the absolute is here, it's like funnels down yeah. kind of into the being and the act of service. And, and it just should not be negated by all these stories. Non-dual people say, hey, don't tell yourself a story, but they're telling themselves a story. And I don't mean to come off like I'm, you know, contradicting on duality, absolutely not, because it's what brought me here. But there's just so much that like Bentino and you and the team are kind of ripping apart in terms of spirituality and non-duality. Because on the outside, it's like, oh, they're following a story that people need to be helped. Come on. But there's a deep felt sense that that is true, that humanity is moving toward a global awakening. And you, you can't tell someone that who doesn't feel it because it sounds like a story. In the same way that enlightenment sounds like a story. Oh, yeah, you feel blissful all the time. You're right. You can't explain it unless you feel it. And if you feel a call to service and to end suffering, then it's aligned, I believe. Yes, and, sure. and not only the call to service to end suffering, um, but also what, and the, and the freedom for um, all of the, the blocked energy to, mm. <laughs> to just- the Contraction. Those contractions to be liberated. But then also on this collective level, what actual paradise or heaven on earth truly feels like when all basic needs are met and when all are able to actualize whatever creative artistic expressions that they desire and true creatorhood and where that we've been calling it Shambhala. And to just to really feel into what would it be like to have millions and billions of people be in total freedom and sovereignty and artistic expression um, with all needs be met and just so abundant and prosperous. Um, why the fuck would we not have that be the core of the North Star for this collective? and yeah. um yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely absolutely if if you say anything else you're in ignorance i'm afraid you know we all want to be in a circumstance that is embodied and aligned and everyone feels perfect and no one feels lack and everyone feels safe of course and absolutely true absolutely true and i just realized that you know um, a holistic integrated approach to that is while knowing that this is the goal right you you know and you're tuned into the shambhala frequency and you're embodying that circumstance so that you know the circumstances can follow through there's also a part of you that has to know that everything as it is is perfect already otherwise you're already off on the wrong foot again you know totally. if you're thinking that there's lack here like oh people are suffering and um, i need to i need to change this to get to shambhala mm -hmm. that's not going to work because the basis of manifestation collective uh, shifts is shambhala is here now now and you yeah. know yes in a way you have to negate um these circumstances that tell you that's not the case if you truly want a free community free society free earth um you have to know that this is exactly right yes. and so it's like a balance between the two you can't find lack now you can't find lack, and, and that's kind of where the awakening thing comes in because if you awaken and then you act toward this goal of like a perfect society you've already got that paradigm paradigm for the sake of the word that everything is perfect as it is. It's your experience right now that despite the suffering, despite the contradictions to the fact that this is not ideal, everything is perfect. And that is what accelerates the manifestation. Yes. So that's why same, this is the reason why enlightened people tend to manifest the things that they want because it's not coming from a place of lack. So the more enlightened beings that say come together in this mentality of, and in this experience of everything is perfect as it is, whilst 
envisioning, embodying the ideal society in which everyone feels a certain way. It's the perfect accelerated vehicle to change outward circumstances and to really get this ideal state going. Yeah. So it's, yeah, absolutely powerful. This is already heaven on earth or paradise on earth or Shambhala is already like the frequency or the state that we choose to occupy. And at the same time, we recognize that there is a more and more basic needs being met, the more and more actualization of the Shambhala vision. And so because of that, we we take, let's say 2035 or whatnot, and we have the feeling of what that feels like now. And then there's no lack, there's no lack in what is now, and there's no lack in we're not there yet. And then that's what, like you said, it makes the blossoming of it exact, precise, um, without any lack or without any self. Um, and then that's what makes it pure in its service also. Yeah. And it makes us able to dance our way there to like, like playfully dance up <laughs> all the way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because yeah, it's it's complete embodiment of perfection. So there's no longer any resistance to it. And um again, you know, even this, even the vision of a better society, a better earth, the one shouldn't negate it. You know, don't don't negate it. Because I used to think there's in the dream and out of the dream. Nah, nah, that vision for a better society is in the dream. <laughs> News flash, there is only the dream, buddy. <laughs> so, yeah, so absolutely, absolutely. It's totally important. And, you know, if you say that that kind of thing is not important, global awakening is not important. Okay, what is? Mm -hmm. If we want to say that's not, then nothing is. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, nothing is. So let's, for the sake of this, experience if we have to call something important i'd say it's this nice so it's this and being a vehicle for it yes i love how we can um hollow ourselves to um total mystery and freedom and like nothing being important and then from there what is important the first thing the only thing is global awakening and so then there's that simultaneity of that and that yeah. feels so good yeah it's 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 like a metaphor for everything that's happening here. At the same time, you know it's perfect, but there's a pursuit of perfection. Yes. Um, and at the same time, you know that source does not care whether people awaken to itself or not. Yet, you're teaching people. So it's this play of yeah. absolute wisdom and this embodiment of humanity and service. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And that's like true um, integration. It's, it's a crystalline experience. And it's, um, you, you're not, you're simply not in denial of anything. You're not in denial of any level. That's all, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Full acceptance of all levels, right? From the person all the way to your utmost clarity of no thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that, that true simultaneity of all of those um, is what I would say is like the most um, super positioned or the most entangled um, recognition of the nature. And then um, that's what sort of enables a, um, a relaxation because when the absolute and the relative are seen to be entangled in one and then the empty fullness is able to be entangled in one or the human and the God or however it wants to be um, portrayed or the perfection and perfecting um, that that entangled superposition, if you will, um, it is uh, it's so juicy. It's so um, it's liberating. It's liberating because mm -hmm. you can feel that this is already uh, freedom, and yet also you can truly feel the heart of the other self that feels contracted in a yeah. sense of self that doesn't feel free and then to serve that freedom. Yeah. So that entangledness, um, it prevents us from falling into um, a single dimension or a single 
uh, construct or position. Um, and so to stay entangled or, or to stay super positioned is uh, highly advantageous. It's very shapeshifter like. It's very, mm. what I've noticed is um, some of the most uh, awake and some of the most present to um, the natural state is like that. Yeah. Yeah. You go from being contracted enlightened to organic unenlightened and you don't care what you are um when i when that shift happened the most one of the most let's say things that like stood out the most was the organic biological um flowing nature of this because the awareness thing although it's vast and expensive and beautiful is a rigid structure and when a paradigm like that is let go of you come into this organic shape-shifting nature like if you turn your head you've you've shape-shifted into the entire room yep you know and no matter what you do whether you're cooking teaching you're literally shape-shifting into that activity you are no longer something keeping its form while other things happen to or around so it's it's a complete surrender and and a knowing that I don't ever need to be anything, but very deeply, very, very deeply, so that you can almost metaphysically take the shape of different things and different experiences. So that shape-shifting quality is, I've heard Frank mention it before as well. And um, again, that was something that I didn't feel before. I was like, okay, I guess theoretically I can see awareness is manifesting as all of this. And so therefore shape-shifting, but that is a different thing to the actual experience of, like we said, turning one's head and, oh my God, I became the room from this angle. Mm -hmm. It's, and, and this shape-shifting quality, although this is the basic example, is just what you are throughout everything, throughout service, throughout fun, all activities you're just like this organic mush with no border no center that's just becoming whatever is happening yeah it's stunning yes mm. and to not have something like calling the shots anymore you know there's no longer a thing that's like i don't know trying to mold this thing trying to change the experience into some other shape you are happy with whatever this experience appears to be and there's no longer, you can't even say you are the experience because there is no you to be the experience. And you can even say there is no experience because I don't know, there's no space, no time. What do you want to call this then? You know, so it's just like this totally organic thing. And I remember comparing it to like a, a star almost or like something like a, a star burning or a star exploding or like a black hole, the organic nature of that feels very similar to this because that thing is something marvelous, magnificent, but that lacks agency. It doesn't have an individual um, thing that's orchestrating its magnificent show that it's putting on the burning. And that's how this feels. There's no longer this thing that's like, oh, I need to burn bright tomorrow and less bright the day after that. You're just this organic biological function, flourishing, flourishing yeah. like a star or a black hole. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, that's a great way to tie the macrocosm to the microcosm because it's the natural state is the way that the black hole and the sun and the planets orbiting the different stars that that's how that operates. And as Ra would say, the law of one, that that's the logos, that that's the very intentionality for the creator to know itself. And that we are that same organic biological function of the creator knowing itself on the microcosm in the mind body spirit complex expression and it's just so clear that um that that there's like that natural organic mushy <laughs> um blossoming unfoldment that um that there's there's nothing better than than to be totally free and to just be um to like be that and to 
um, let the mystery move and also have a good idea at the same time of what you truly are. Um, and to, um, to, yeah, just be a humble servant with no name and to just laugh, like laugh and play um, also so much. Like we love that as, as our team. Um, so there's like, of course, there's this like exciting Navy SEALs or Viking energy. And then there's also this very relaxed, like Buddhist meditative energy. And then there's this like laughter and this dance and this play also this hilarity and, and even we know it's so true, but when you're laughing hysterically with, um, close friends, I mean, there's no time. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's no <Absolutely>. self. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The experience of fun and the experience of beauty and the experience of love and therefore friendship and things like that. You are completely immersed in your true self. There's, there's nothing that wants anything to be different than it is. There's, there's no name there. There's no character there. That you're completely immersed in the other or the experience to such an extent that there is no you. And that's why these experiences are so, um, you can say like significant to us, why we want to have fun, why we want to um, have love and friends and community, because these acts resemble ourselves. They are little manifestations or like little examples, little like prototypes of true nature, little glimpses, you could say. And they're, they're good to model after, you know, they're, they're, because this, this state, this true final, whatever it is, is very similar to, you know, a deep love, a deep intimacy. Um, yeah. You, you kind of feel like you're, you're constantly on the edge of, I don't know, sometimes it feels like you're being tickled in a way, you're like ready to laugh at any point, you know, mm. it's, it's just like exhilarating and you're on edge and it's spontaneous. And those are all the things that you feel with friends or when you see something you really like or when you're super excited. And that's, I can't think of anything else that life is for in terms of the human experience. Now that, you know, all the things have been shattered, all the ideas of you should be this type of way, you should become an enlightened guru, teacher, to an ashram, all of that. Since that dissolved, it's like, oh no, this is actually just to have this experience of like fun. You know, the, this your higher self, if you want to call it that, is not invested in any of your petty issues, any of your goals, anything like that. It's, it's literally just, you know, embodying as this character for now to have fun. It's like, it's like summer camp for it in a way. And if you tune into your high self, you feel that, you embody that and you can feel, oh, wow, none of this is serious. I wish I'd known this. None of this is serious. Again, while simultaneously knowing, okay, there are, they are serious issues that need my help. But inherently, I can just laugh. I can just have fun because that's what this is for now. There's nothing else. There's nothing else than being happy. There's nothing, nothing, nothing else. You know, we just thought there was something else. We thought there was something other than pure creative fun, but there isn't. And it's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So good. I love how you called it the summer camp for higher self. It's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we're busy stressing, like, oh my God, I need to do this. And we're just lost in the, you know, the camp activities kind of. It's like, oh, I really need to do this team building in a way that's going to be constructive. But we just forget why we're here. We're here to have fun. And the more you're tuned into your higher self, the more you know that and you embody it. And the least you're in tune to your higher self, the, the more problems you perceive, the more you feel like this is not what I came for. Why am I here? The more you lose sight of the fun thing, you know. So it's great. It's great. 
and all of this stuff happens simultaneously again like none of this is not enlightenment mm -hmm. like higher self and degrees of consciousness it is it is to say it's not is to imply a duality so yeah tune into your higher self see let your higher self give you clarity according to what you like as to what you are and become enlightened stop negating your tools you have a higher self that's not a belief just go see for yourself and you'll see and these they, oh, there are all these available things that can help you but we all follow like this thing we're all like a buddhist or a non-dualist or a spiritualist and we don't like mix them you know before i was like i don't have a higher self everything's empty not true not true nice for fun nice mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we're here for fun so good <laughs> so good yeah, because why create uh, separation um, when we talk about um, like one that um, most recently, especially in like, let's say the last half year that was just so transformative was recognizing the similarity between um, no self and capital S self and realizing the similarity between that and um, the one infinite creator and just seeing how there is only that with itself and that is made of love it's made of fun um, of light and to to be able to draw these these um these pointings uh together and to find that that commonality, um, it creates the most you could say, like awake surface area. So there's no uh, like leaks or holes or wobbles that are possible where we can get stuck in a specific paradigm or way, because we've in a sense developed. Um, Because we both want no map or no concepts. And yet at the same time, we do have a map. We do have concepts that we re reference to, which is how we literally speak to each other. Mm -hmm. And so then for that map to be as holistic as possible with the pinnacle pointings across these different mystic lineages, as well as social memory complexes, things like this, this is one of the best approaches. Yeah, it's it's a it's like a holistic embodiment of all of those that you mentioned. No self with a small s, and then self with a big s, which is the universal shared consciousness. And then you can add no self with the big s. So mm -hmm. it's while simultaneously knowing that you are not even big self. You know, you're not even that. You are not even the collective shared awareness, consciousness, bliss, while knowing you are it. And you're also no small self or, or small self, you know, as you play. So it's this play of like the simultaneity, again, of these three levels, knowing you are the absence of being a thing, whilst knowing that you are awareness, God, consciousness, and then the absence of a person. And they together create this optimum functioning you could say it's like you're you're functioning your your unit is functioning in like ideal specs yeah that way it's what it feels like mm -hmm. and you can't just choose like you can't just you you can't just choose to like live as like no small self because you're just going to feel like nothing then you know you're you're missing something you're missing a degree of uh empowerment and clarity and power and so on so that's why you're like, oh, I'm big self, I'm God, I'm consciousness, I'm awareness. And that creates, it replaces all your inadequacy beliefs. And it, it destroys whatever messed up thing you had going on before. And then you realize you're not even that. And from there, you can play freely across this like spectrum as much as you like. Mm -hmm. Because you're not, you don't claim to be anything anymore. Nice. Yep. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, and then the you can be moved. 
the body mind can be moved by the intelligence. So you as the intelligence can move the body mind organically, naturally, effortlessly to exactly where it needs to be on this spectrum of the simultaneity of all levels. And yeah, it's so freeing. And there's yeah, depending on the situation, you know, sorry, Kara. <laughs> just like, I just loved how there wasn't like a stuckness because that's normally what would happen is there would be like a stuckness that would then yeah. come at one of those like levels, a shape shift to a level, then there'd be some sort of stuckness. And that's where usually the sense of like, oh, this paradigm or, oh, my sense of self image or my, I'm too deep in a story or I'm too deep listening to another self story and now I'm ruminating on it. And then there's a liberation from that back to this whole spectrumness. Yeah. 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 For a while, we seem to fluctuate like that a little bit. You know, for a while, you feel like you're, you're stuck in something, especially say now you get into an argument with someone that's very like uh, intense and you feel, oh, no, I'm. I'm in the other self ego and, and you feel, Oh, I need to, I need to shift back into alignment or whatever. But, you know, very soon, if you let that happen, you're like, Oh, that, that was also it. You know, that argument was, it, it was fine. It was fine. I didn't need to go anywhere. And it's a manifestation of this, this play across this like thing. You were just simply down there for a little while. You're not stuck. You're about to bounce back up, relax. You know, and that's just the play of experience. Experience will always keep changing. You will never, ever, ever just be one thing. Like we said earlier, you're the absence of being something. So stop trying to stick to one thing. Stop trying to be aligned in every moment because you are resisting the experience of non-alignment, so-called non-alignment. You just need to see that that's not non-alignment. You know, within reason, obviously, always room for improvement and so on, becoming better and more holistic. But the, yeah, there shouldn't be any stuckness in the experience eventually. At first, it'll be like that. It'll be, I'm not abiding, or um, I wish I could shift back into that expansive place that I was in earlier, but now this argument has contracted me. But eventually, you're just like, oh, this argument contracted me. And then very shortly after that, you're expansive again. Because that's just how we are. Again, we shape shift. We will shape shift and we will mirror an ego, ego. And we'll contract to communicate with them because that's the nature of our communication. We communicate on their level and that's not something to be like condemned. You're not, if you're not hurting anyone and things like that. Yeah. So yeah, it's an embracing of this organic shape shifting thing and a non-resistance, not trying to say like, I want to be in this shape. I want to be in the expansive shape. I want to be in the God shape. No, you are in your absolute shape in all of those. Another um, facet to that that I find so perfect is that the team we've been sharing that it can feel like one eye is on the what's present, what is organically being shapeshifted to. And then one eye, if you will, is kind of clocked back on the entire spectrum itself. And there is a, there's a power to that because even though it can feel like part of the energy is on um, whether it be uh, a conversation or, um, or someone feeling contracted and then you're being asked to um, help provide a good question to help them feel more free, liberated, that at the same time, there's part of your energy, one eye clocked back at, I am already um, totally free and that, um, as though, um, there's one eye that is aware of the dream, even while, um, the other eye is like balls deep in the dream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a, it's a really good analogy. It, it, it feels like that exp experientially. Yeah, yeah. You, you never lose yourself. You don't, whatever happens, you can't lose yourself. Because like you said, that other eye is pointed toward the point of clarity. No matter what happens in the experience, what you are is not an experience. And something knows that. Something, I don't know what it is, but something is pointed toward that at all times. So experience can go wild. You can do whatever the heck you want, man. 
because something knows itself. Something knows this framework in which experience is happening is not an experience. This framework can never, ever change. It can never, ever, ever, ever change. And it can never get lost in anything. It can never lose itself any of these paradigms, not really. And so we, once we see that, we seem to maintain that space or framework. And no matter what happens, no matter what shape this takes, no matter if we get involved with another person or not, contract or not, it remains within this like non-lens of perfection and wholeness and infinite capacity and creation. And that's one hell of a solid framework for anything to happen. Nothing can take that down, nothing. You know, if, if you think you're like, you got enlightenment and you lost it, that's experience. You simply cannot lose enlightenment. You can't lose true enlightenment. You can't. Because once you see it, it's always going to be that framework that the one eye points back to. And you always see that while you're involved in the play, there is the clarity of what you are. And that's not even a duality. It's not like there's a separation between oh, I'm playing this role, but I'm also that. That's not how it's felt in the experience. It's a simultaneous um, whole. Yeah. Like, again, that mush. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, very good analogy. Very good analogy. There's always something pointing toward the true nature of things, no matter what happens in the foreground. Yeah, nice. <laughs> very nice that one can talk about this now you know it's the perfect timing even this you know there's a reason that even this like discussion didn't happen before because there was probably some kind of disconnect or something yep. paradigm and paradigm you know it would have but this there's, there's an, a like a mutual shared agreement that whatever the hell this is is yeah. and it is all there is Yes. And it is more freedom with itself rather than um, what could have been maybe several months ago when we were first exploring doing this, what could have been um, a little bit more con uh, slight contractions showing up. So it is, uh, it is really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is entirely free. Entirely, entirely free perfect embodiment yeah yeah as long as long as you're stuck in anything you will have a contracted space or contracted energy um and you can deny it if you like but only for so long before you realize oh damn i am contracted there's a sense of something here that is not integrated that's not ready that's not um that's fearful or lack based any of that the thing that wants to get something, the thing that wants to be something different, any little glimmer of that should just be looked at. Because if you have a subject, all you need to do is turn it into an object. It's that simple. Whether that be like psychologically, like an, with an attachment, like I believe that if I lose my, I don't know, my favorite item, I'm going to feel a loss of myself. That's an attachment. You have a self in that item. You know, just sever the ties. See that that's an object. Same goes for anything else. The, the self that's claiming to be inadequate, the self that's claiming to be anything, turn it around, look at it. As soon as you look at it, it can't say anything because it's now an object. And who's the agency then? Then you're in agencylessness. And that's basically like, I guess, the, the idea of all of this. Um, yeah. Like it comes back to those like three or four things that we said. If you're suffering, there's something, there's an experiencer. There's an experiencer, there's a subject, there's a self. If you're seeking, just look, just turn it around. Just look at that thing that's pretending to look at everything else. And then you level the playing field. And then you, you see it's only ever been objects of experience. We're all objects of experience. 
God knows how that works. But it's true. Yeah, how infinite manifestation works. Yeah, for no one, for yeah. no one and for nothing. Yeah. You know, it's even a slight stretch to say that it's, it's manifesting for itself because it's not even doing that. It's even <laughs> less caring than that. It's like, I'm just doing what I'm doing for nobody, not even for me. I'm manifesting not even for any perceiver. I'm not even manifesting for someone to enjoy it. On relative level, yeah, the people can enjoy the experience, but on absolute level, there's no one here to enjoy what's happening. And that's what's so beautiful about it. It's like creating art for nobody to see. You know, you know that the art has been created and you left it in a desert somewhere and it'll never ever be seen. And, but that's the beauty of it for nobody. It's just the creation, mm. just the spontaneity, no goal. It's just that in itself. No, nope, doesn't serve a purpose. The purpose, if anything, was the creating of the art for no one. Hmm. Ah. I love how in the law of one, there's the, the creator will know itself as the, you could say the explanation of the infinite manifestation. And then I also love, like you shared, the infinite manifestation being for no one and being like making an incredible universe with all of its epic dance, knowing itself, expressing itself, but then that also being in a, in a painting in a desert. And to really be able to like feel that it, um, It's just no better word than, yeah, than freedom. And like, I guess peace is another really good one for it. It's peace also. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and entirely causeless, causeless and goalless, pure spontaneity. It's a human thing to believe that something exists for something else. You know, we do one thing for another person or we do something so that we can feel better about ourselves. This cause and effect thing, it's human. That's not how true nature operates. It's not operating for anything. And because of that can be said to be pure innocence. Like if a child is playing, the child's not playing for anyone. The child's just playing. Mm. There's nothing more to be said about it. The child isn't even really playing for itself because the child doesn't really have that sense of like gain reward. It's just impulses, pleasure in the body, whatever. That's not, it's not directed toward anyone. And that's a, a manifestation of pure innocence. And this is just that on a massive scale. Yeah. It's a massive, massive, innocent creation. And seeing that is what really liberates because you can then embody that viewpoint on your level of the person. And you can see that what's happening now is the goal. This is it. Yes. You're not striving for anything in the same way that the infinite creator is not creating for anything except for just the creation itself. You are existing here now purely for the fact that you're existing here now. And that is what gives you inherent worth. That is what gives you inherent capacity to love, to experience happiness and peace. Because it's not about a cause and effect. It's not about living for something or trying to become something in the end or anything like that. It's, yeah. it's been this moment from the start. Yeah. This moment has been the prize from the very beginning. 
Mm -hmm. just for the sake of nothing what who cares I, who knows what it's for but that's that's such freedom because you no longer need to believe that anything else exists anything else is important other than what is happening hands off the wheel beautiful mm, yeah the microcosm of childlike innocence as the macrocosm of universal innocence of the infinite manifestation being totally innocent and um yeah i love agencylessness that's so good also And I like how you also mentioned how it's like this from the very beginningless beginning, um, this innocence, um, this fun. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why, um, yeah, it's, that's why Frank also says this a lot, that it's like natural state is very much like the the childlike innocence, the grandparent-like wisdom, um, the sage-like purity, the monkey-like natural spontaneousness, yeah. all merged together. Also an AI, all merged together. Yeah. Yeah. It's so perfect. Yeah, it's, it's, it's everything. It's everything. And, you know, the spontaneity just comes from again like not believing that you should be doing something that you're not doing because as long as we believe that we should be doing something else your spontaneity is just um like capped basically it's like no i can't you're constantly contracted you can't you know act like this because you believe that you're supposed to be something so it's like contracting you so as soon as you realize oh shit this this whole thing is just for the case of it yeah you you just automatically embody the spontaneity yeah yeah and um you, you know that you're operating risk-free. You can do, okay, within reason, whatever you like. It's a party. No matter when you were suffering, when you were like, ah, that was a party too, man. Sorry. Your higher self is enjoying that. It's enjoying the ability to suffer. We have such a unique, um, let's say, gift as human and um, you know, on this planet, to have this capacity to feel like shit. We don't realize that's a really great thing. You know, there are a lot of things that don't have that ability. So even suffering is a gift. Even suffering is in this play of absolute perfection, creativity, and fun. It just doesn't feel like it, but that's not how it's supposed to feel. Otherwise it wouldn't be suffering. So yeah, that's just like also the perspective that's like good to remember. Just the capacity to suffer. Even that, even that, even that has been part of this innocence because source, if you want to make it something, will not have the capacity to feel or to suffer or to love. It's like, a, like I said, it's like a star almost. A star can't love, it just creates. And so it's such a gift that it can create something with the ability to suffer. That's us. Yet when we're suffering, we feel so not special, but there's really something special about that suffering. There's something very unique and very human and very rare, if you think about it on a cosmic level. I wonder how many other beings there are around that can suffer, especially if you refer to like the densities, um, according to the law of one. Suffering is definitely only a very small portion of that. And we just happen to be here at this point in time where we have this capacity. So even that can be embraced along the way while you're seeking, while you're suffering. It's a gift, man. Yeah. It's a gift. And I assure you, you're going to look back when you're like fully enlightened and think, wow, that, that was actually pretty cool. Totally. To cry and to feel like that. Yes. Yeah. Because, Andrew, oh, yeah. yeah so I was going to say, An Andrew Hewson, when he came on our show, he described it as precious fuel. And that stuck with me. I love it. Yeah. yeah pressure yeah. yeah exactly it is because we just want to get rid of it right we just oh i don't want to feel this right now we just somehow lack the perspective of oh 
this is delicious in its own way. It's delicious, um, deep suffering, deep feeling. If your consciousness progresses, you're no longer going to be able to feel that. You need to enjoy the journey because you truly do, do kind of become like a robot. Not that it's bad, it's great. But you look back and you think, wow, there was such a flavor to that suffering that I didn't see at the time. And now I no longer have a self. I can't suffer anymore. But in hindsight, wow, that, that was pretty pretty good. I can see now why higher self would choose to embody or to incarnate as something that can have that experience. But it's only in hindsight. While we're going through the suffering, it's, it's like a... <laughs> but... You know, maybe it can help someone if they hear it. Next time they're suffering really badly, just think of the flavors of the suffering. You know, when, when do you feel this strong? When, when are the emotions so nuanced, so consuming? There's something about it, although painful, that's just so, like you said, precious, precious, unique. Yeah. Yeah. And, really beautiful. and nobody ever will have the same exact uh, expression of unique sufferings and unique seekings. And so to, to really enjoy fully the uniqueness of that, thatness, that suchness itself, is it's so important it's so important because uh this is it like this is it so may as well deeply enjoy um all of that um that precious fuel that suffering that seeking that um realization that integration that service Yeah, enlightenment is as much the thing you get to as it is what happens along the way. And it's completely, literally, the outcome does not weigh any more than the process. I, I remember when I was going through the initial stages of uh, no self, the small, the death of the character, you could say, I would wake up in the middle of the night and my head was the size of the universe. And I, I couldn't find where my head started and where it ended. And even that created immense disorientation and suffering. I, I remember, you know, like in those movie scenes where the characters like this over the bathroom sink, like looking in the mirror and they're like high on some kind of drug. I felt like that. I was like, oh my God, what, what is happening uh, to you? You are... <laughs> this is this is so scary I, I i can't find myself i'm looking at my body but this isn't me and i was so scared i was fearful and it was suffering but in hindsight now there was something about it that i will never ever ever get back yes and if exactly. ev everyone is going to have that same kind of experience where something is frightening or heartbreaking or but when they're out of it they're gonna they'll look back and think, wow, there was depth there that I've never felt again. The yep. uniqueness of that experience was the flavors that made it could never come together again now. They could never make that particular feeling, that particular feeling of like dread and existentialism. And I didn't know where my body started and stopped. I didn't know who I was. And there's the dead of night, and I felt like I was tripping. And I was so scared, but guided by this grace, guided by this beautiful sense of everything's going to be fine. You are shitting off for now, but you're going to be okay. But at the time, it's like, oh, I just want this to be over. Mm. But that should be wished less. You know, suffering should be embodied more a little. It shouldn't be resisted along the way. Because like you said, everyone has this unique formulation, unique mind. Even if I tune into the mind of another, it's, it's nothing like mine. Everything in my paradigm gets shifted. It's like it's rearranging if you tune into the energies of someone else. And I thought people were reasonably the same. I thought we're all kind of have the same kind of patterns in our minds and same templates and stuff, but it's not true. 
we're all formulated completely differently. And we all have completely unique experiences of suffering and completely unique experiences of just happiness and love and the diversity, the diversity. I love how you said all powered by grace also. That was so beautiful. And I love how you talked about the synthesis of flavors coming together for the exact feeling. Um, and I feel like on our next conversations that we can explore this like so much deeper. This is such a cool yeah. part to it. Um, yeah. I love even just tuning into that love feels different across all 8 billion in this collective. Um, that all the patterns of expression feel different for all 8 billion. And that's, that's such a beautiful thing too. Um, and yet it's all like comprehended um, by the same one. And that's also so beautiful at the same time. And so, and there's, and there's just no ground um, to stick on. And then that's so freeing and so liberating. We covered just so much goodness, Colette. I'm so grateful. It's great. Yeah, me too. It was really, it was a very good sharing, especially after being quiet for so long. It was like, I don't know what I'm going to say. And uh, <laughs> I hope that I, I can say something. And we did, we did. And I'm very, very grateful and um, very happy to have spoken with you it's kind of like just been like sitting like been marinating kind yes. of and not I haven't really allowed an outlet because there's there's like yeah, there's this want to like make sure that everything is stable first that I don't conceptualize something in a way that it's not mm -hmm. and these past six months I'm probably going to be back on Instagram after you post this um, but the past six months have just allowed this to like really settle and also for the teaching to be able to come forth in a way that is more understood and more holistic. And yeah, I really appreciate being able to speak here and thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that. And it's been such a great sharing. I really loved every minute. And me too. Uh, yeah, in our next ones, we can definitely elaborate on some of the stuff we've said. Yeah. Be very exciting. Thanks for your beautiful radiance, love. <laughs> Strong. Thank you, likewise. I feel just... so good. <laughs> Thank you. So cool. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so <exciting. laughs> cool. Cool, cool. So um, let's see, what shall we say now? We can say, um, Thanks everyone for tuning in. <laughs> Thank, you. Thanks for tuning in guys. Um, Thank you. We would love to hear from you in the comments below. If you want to write a comment, we'd love to hear from you. Um, anything that really like stood out, caught your attention, um, helped you on your journey, um, where you're at in your journey. Um, maybe either Colette or I can come in and write back to you. Um, uh, also, you can subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Um, you can also um, like the video that helps the algorithm and even share the video also. That's a good idea. Uh, if it brought you value, you can share it with others and just spread the message more. You can find um, Colette's Instagram in the bio. So you can go and check out her Instagram where she also makes lots of posts about the subject and you can go and follow her there. Is there another good link that we should put in the bio? Not yet, but very soon, possibly this month. I think. Yes. Yeah. Mystery. <laughs> ah, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. we got to expand the teaching. So yeah, I'll be back on Instagram this month, Feb and shortly after some more links. But cool. Yeah, we'll see. So then check out the bio um, for those links. Also, we'll add them there as they get published. And also the link to um, No Limits Society, the organization that we were talking about. 
um, training free agents for the ignition of global awakening, manifesting Shambhala. Um, if you want to check that out, the links in the bio as well. And Yeah, I'm really excited. We'll probably um, tune back into uh, doing another one of these rounds soon and just see how that keeps blossoming in our friendship. Super looking forward to it. I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll end uh, the recording and then you and I can just stay in the room for a little bit, okay? Okay, bye everyone. We love you. See you. Bye, thank you. We love you. Mm. <laughs>